We now turn to the second case on this morning's docket. That is case number 106429, Jerry L. Martell as conservator for Kim Travis Driscoll appellants, the Sandra Driscoll, Leroy Driscoll appellee, <coughs> Becky Mullins, and Dorothy McCarty. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, Ed Gillette on behalf of Ms. Driscoll, or I'm sorry, Ms. Martell and Kyle Branson is also present. As I indicated, Ms. Martell is here. Um, Ms. Martell is, in fact, the conservator for her brother. Um, um, and we brought this action. Um, it's been a long road to get here. We started in Lemoore County. Uh, we were moved to Jefferson County. We were kicked out of Jefferson County, and now we're here. And the issue, very simply, is whether or not uh, we can make a claim for negligent entrustment um, based upon the facts as presented. Um, Justice Biles indicated in the last argument, should we look at Ling versus Jan's liquor? I uh, would ask the court to do that. Uh, I believe I did in my brief, as a matter of fact. Um, I thought about this case because I initially represented Mr. Driscoll in his DUI, and he was charged because of the accident, and I started thinking exactly, well, what brought this situation to occur in the first instance? And it was apparent to me that there was a family agreement between brothers and sisters to let the brother drive the car even though he didn't have a license, everybody knew. He was drinking all the time because they didn't want to drive him around. And what ended up happening is, is he was severely injured, over half a million dollars in medical. The guy can hardly even speak. Uh, he can't take care of himself. And so his sister now has to do all that. And so... But essentially, bottom line, you're wanting a cause of action uh, in which one person is charged with the duty to protect another person from his or her own shortcomings and bad judgment. Especially if you know about it. And everybody knew about it in this case, Justice Johnson. Everybody knew about it. The situation here in this particular case, and as I'm sure defense will argue to you, and they did in their brief, the Lydia case, the Chief Justice there issued a decision indicating, I can't understand or fathom a set of facts that would would cause that uh, situation liability to occur. Well, if, if there was a set of facts, this is it. Do, do you do you see a distinction between those cases, um, for instance, involving the one involving the child where Grandpa puts him in the driver's seat, um, between uh, uh, where the entrustee is uh, incapable of exercising good judgment or care because of tender age or because of disabilities or whatever, and one in which a person is simply um, incapable of exercising the discipline um, to, to use good judgment uh, uh, in respect to the duty of care uh, in that regard. I do, Justice Johnson, but this is simply an extension of that. I mean, I am certain that this court has seen time after time issues much like this where an individual can't, for whatever reason, contain their actions and criminal cases get filed, civil issues arise, and this is clearly one of them. And it happens daily in our society given the fact of the current status of DUI law, if you lose your driver's license, somebody's going to go ahead and help you get a car, even though you're not supposed to be driving it, so you can continue to drive and get around the breathalyzer, the intoxilizer machine. It happens. It, it's a very real situation that we see as practitioners out there in the field daily. And so... Given that particular situation, now are you trying? Are, are you making any argument um, that the bad judgment here was involuntary on the part of Travis? Yeah, you know, I'd love to say that, but no. Okay. Honestly, I mean, how could I? He was the guy who clearly had been drinking 
um, to a certain extent, but he was also the guy who was enabled to drive a vehicle because his brothers and sisters all worked in concert to procure the vehicle even though they knew he didn't have a driver's license, they insured the vehicle, they tagged the vehicle. It was a family agreement that ended up going very badly wrong for Travis. And the, um, the um, Appley re relies heavily on a South Carolina case that basically found that in a comparative fault state such as ours, uh, that the um, and your your client would be, per se, by law, um, more than 50% at fault in a situation of involuntary intoxication. Um, how do you respond to that? Because that's kind of what they're relying on and basically asking us to do. Well, I understand that, Justice Rosen. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not immune to the issues that I have to deal with if this court allows me to proceed forward. But what we've got here, first of all, is in Lydia versus George, which is the case you referred to. The chief wrote the opinion there. There was a dissent by two individuals who clearly indicated, two of the justices said, I don't see a situation where there could be so much fault that it would preclude the plaintiff from recovering. I think this is one of those situations, given the fact that we've got multiple defendants multiple claims and the more we look at this particular situation the more we recognize that maybe and i think we can proceed that way in front of a jury that there's the possibility the very real possibility that the guy who actually enabled and if you read the deposition it's part of the record and i'm talking about leroy driscoll enabled his brother and by the way he's actually his nephew he's not his brother but they call each other brother um I believe that a jury, when they hear those facts, will look at that particular uncle, brother, whatever you want to call him, and say, that's the guy who's most liable for this particular situation. And I think that there are particular cases out there, and this is one of them, which we should be allowed to proceed forward with in front of a jury on that issue. Did I answer your question? Um, and as we discussed... In our brief, negligent entrustment in clearly Shirley versus Glass, we've cited it, you've talked about it, and you're clearly considering it at this point in time. It's part and parcel and extension of what we're requesting the court to do as well, except take it one step further in our particular request, along with looking at the public policy issues which currently exist in the state of Kansas, and Ling versus Jan's Liquor is one of them. I would seriously ask this court to look at that case and revisit it. The legislature has had ample opportunity year after year. This court, the Court of Appeals, has often said the legislature should be looking at it. It seems to me everybody wants a change in the way the landscape, legal landscape exists with respect to dram shop liability in Kansas except maybe the legislature, and frankly, I don't understand why. Given the fact that the DUI laws have increased substantially from a year ago, um, and the only thing I can assume, uh, given the fact that I think there's either 41 or 42 states that currently have dram shop liability, is, is that somehow someone doesn't want to see something of such a huge import occur in the state of Kansas for financial reasons. Is that up to us? I think it can be. I'm confident it can be. It's a question of whether or not you want to do it. I mean, clearly the legislature at this point in time doesn't want to do it. Or if they have, they certainly haven't discussed it. They're dealing with other matters, as this court I'm sure is well aware of. Today, there are a couple of different uh, particular bills in front of the Senate and the House that, frankly, um, don't do anything for the people of Kansas and, in fact, take away uh, certain um, rights and, and uh, liberties that we currently enjoy. So, yeah, I, I think it's up to you. And, I, I, frankly, I, I would encourage you to do it. Look at it seriously. There is so much going on out there in this day and age with respect to issues concerning Dram Shop that, the, that this court should look at it. We have had cases 
time after time where the prosecutor will bring in a restaurant employee who serves somebody over serves them and then uses them to testify against them in a criminal matter we've had a liquor store that actually sold liquor to a clearly intoxicated individual and then called the police and had him arrested and testified against them we've had servers in bars over serve people and then call the police when they leave it goes on all the time we see it all the time yet it never gets addressed and it needs to be addressed so if the legislature doesn't want to deal with it then i would ask this court to recognize it and respond to it the bottom line here ladies and gentlemen of the court is is that we believe we have a viable cause of action we believe we can proceed forward with the jury we don't believe that a jury will assess more than 50 percent of the fault against our client in this particular case and we want the opportunity to present that to a jury and that's why we're asking the court to consider our request any questions of counsel thank you thank you Good morning, Brett Hart on behalf of Appley Leroy Driscoll. A first party negligent entrustment claim under these facts is in a fundamental contradiction to the public policy of the state of Kansas. Individuals in this state are encouraged by the laws to have responsibility for their own actions, including their own consequences for those actions. If they make a decision and they suffer injuries, then they should be held responsible for their own negligence. This public policy is supported in the modified comparative fault standard that this state has. It's also supported in the analogous case law uh, regarding dram shop. This court in Well, then if it's uh, supported by comparative negligence, why don't you just let the jury decide um, whether uh, that responsibility lies with the lendee or with the lendor? Your Honor, I would point back to the Lydia Court in South Carolina where they also have modified comparative fault. The, the modified comparative negligence scheme bars recovery for this type of claim when it's taken in concert with public policy considerations, which are identical in Kansas as they are in South Carolina. Well, see, I don't understand that. If you're going to say there's comparative negligence, then the court shouldn't be taking that away from the fact finder. Uh, if you're going to say, as a matter of public policy, one is not uh, has no duty to protect another against his or her voluntary uh, uh, exercise of bad judgment, that's one thing. But I understand you're arguing that it dovetails with comparative negligence, and I don't think it does. Your Honor, I, I think the comparative fault is tied to the po public policy. I think modified comparative fault supports the public policy considerations that we want individuals to be responsible for their own negligence. And in this case, the plaintiff is not a protected class. Being an alcoholic, alcohol abuse is not a protected class such as tender years or mental deficiency. Um, it, he chose voluntarily to become intoxicated without knowledge of my client on that date that he was going to be intoxicated or that he was going to operate a vehicle intoxicated. Now, it's complete difference as to third-party negligent entrustment, and even the South Carolina um, court said the policy considerations which support legal theory of third-party negligent entrustment are undermined by applying them to first-party negligent what entrustment. What if he would have handed the keys to him and he was already intoxicated? Would that still preclude the claim? I think it might might not, Your Honor. It wouldn't. I, I think it's possible under those facts if he had knowledge that he was incompetent. That being said, still under Section 390, which this court has adopted, it says that the plaintiff, Travis Driscoll, has responsibility for his actions. Now, if Leroy Driscoll sees that he's incompetent, unable to operate a motor vehicle, that's possible. But I think that also sort of dovetails into the, the Ling case, which which supports the public policy considerations. This court said the proximate cause of an injury, in that case to the plaintiff, was the act of the purchaser in drinking the liquor, not the vendor in selling it. 
The proximate cause of this accident was Travis Driscoll deciding to become voluntary intoxicated and then deciding to operate a vehicle on the roadways of Kansas. I'm just unclear as to why a jury can't make that determination rather than you sitting up here telling us that's what it is and a, a judge saying that's what it is as a matter of law. And that seems to me what comparative fault is all about, is that this, these facts are put before the jury and they determine um, whether there's more than 50% fault or not. You might prevail on your argument, but isn't that the jury's role in this and not a legal determination? I think that is a fair um, point. That being said, I think the legislature, partly at least, adopted modified comparative fault as a way to protect public policy because they want individuals to be responsible for their actions. And it's so inconceivable, as the Lydia Court in South Carolina noted, we cannot imagine how one could be more than 50 percent they must not be very creative in their imagination, because I could certainly think of scenarios where that could take place. I, I mean, you can th think of scenarios and or, that are likely to occur. And under under that position is they're just precluded uh, from bringing, bringing their facts uh, on a negligence claim. Isn't negligent by the, entrustment claim. The Liddy, the, that, that court's very language seems to indicate they were making a fact-finding. I, I, let's assume that we don't accept the Lydia Court's analysis. Do you have anything else to point us to? Well, the, uh, the appellants, they didn't refer to it in their argument here, but they referred to it in a, in a letter and a supplement to this court, Hayes versus Royer, which was recently decided in the Missouri Court of Appeals. And even the Missouri Court of Appeals, now Missouri has pure comparative, meaning that even 1% in the plaintiff could recover. But they say... The same result may follow in states that bar recovery or even have modified comparative, such as Kansas, when the plaintiff's percentage of fault is greater than that of the defendants. Even Missouri recognized that a pure comparative, when taken in concert with public policy, may prevent this. And maybe that's a reason why you don't allow first-party negligent entrustment cases. I guess I also want to question you about your, your opening statement, which you've repeated again, which is that an individual has to have responsibility for their decisions. How do you make, how do we, how does your client have responsibility for his decision knowing what he knew about this, this driver that he handed the keys to that he permitted to drive the vehicle? How does he have responsibility then? Well, he didn't know and, and I understand facts are not necessarily to be taken into account here, but my client didn't know that his brother or nephew was going to be intoxicated at the time that he drove the car. Now, whether he supplied a vehicle to a person that was not licensed to have a vehicle, that's a separate issue. But he didn't know he was going to operate a vehicle at all times intoxicated. It's he possible did, did for an he, alcoholic to be sober. I guess I'm, I, I think I see what you're doing, which is saying under a certain set of facts... Had he been intoxicated when he when he gave him the keys, then maybe there's maybe there's a cause of action for first party entrustment. But some knowledge, I think. Is but isn't required. there some knowledge here that didn't he have DUIs? He had prior DUIs. He'd also been. And was in there rehab. knowledge? And is the allegation that there was knowledge of the prior DUIs and that he drank alcohol on a regular basis? I mean, aren't you kind of blurring this whole issue? I mean, it's not just. He either knew he was intoxicated at the time or he didn't. There's, there's all these variations, gradations in between of what he knew about this person's history. There are variations. And I, I think it's very important as to what he knew on that day. Did he know he was going to use it at that well, time? Right. Well, but that makes it a fact question. That makes it a fact question, doesn't it, for a jury to decide? I think that's a fair point. I'm trying to figure out if there's one more difference here. And that is that if you were handing the keys to a person who was visibly too drunk to drive at the time, he handed them the keys, he has knowledge not only of that person's impairment, but of that person's inability to make any kind of decision, wise decision, prudent decision, responsible decision at that moment. It's not only knowledge um, about his general condition, but his inability to make to be responsible for his own actions. Is that what you're trying to get at? 
Yes. I'm wondering if that isn't really, it's more about his knowledge of an inability to make, to behave as a reasonable person. And in this case, he didn't know he was going to use it on the day. He didn't know he was going to use the car. He certainly That's didn't. That's what I understand. I'm just trying to understand why you can see that you may have a first party claim in the in the one instance and that you absolutely believe you don't now. I, I'm trying to figure out what the distinction is. And I think the distinction has to do with the inability of the person who's to whom the keys are entrusted um, to make, to behave as a reasonable person. Yes, sir. Isn't that what I discussed with Mr. Gillette, the difference between um, involuntarily exercising bad judgment mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. voluntarily exercising? I think one other distinction from the example given to you is the difference between current conduct and future conduct. In this case, we're asking to hold that the standard of care is that one person owes a duty to another to prevent uh, the, them from ex voluntarily exercising bad judgment in the future. Isn't that the difference between the distinction and handing the keys when they're sober and when yes. they're, okay. And again, I think it goes back to knowledge. What that person had knowledge of at that time. Do you have any further presentation, Council? No, Your Honor. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. We thank both Council for your arguments this morning. The Court will take this matter under advisement. This time the Court is in recess for 15 minutes.